everyone. I'm Trisha Gelman, and I am the CMO at Drift, and you're listening to CMO Conversations. My goal with this podcast is to help you understand how to learn and grow to keep up with the changing world of marketing, and especially to excel in the role of a CMO. Today's guest is Carol Carpenter, the CMO of VMware. She's been a product manager, a GM, a CEO, and not to mention a marketing exec many times over. There's so much I want to talk to Carol about today, but let's jump into it. Carol, would you like to just add a little bit to your intro and also to um, the definition of how you would describe, you know, VMware? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so I have been here at VMware about three months. It has been an exciting journey. It's, it's an interesting time, obviously, with the pandemic to be onboarding. And I have to say, for the most part, it's gone fairly smoothly, thanks to a lot of amazing technology, including some VMware technology called Workspace ONE. And um, I, I would tell you that before I was a general manager, I would consider myself like an average marketer. And there's something pretty unique that happens when you're a general manager or a CEO or somebody who has to actually report a number every few weeks with a commit gut stretch. You, you become laser focused on what really will move the needle. And so I think of, I like to think of myself as a holistic marketer, somebody who thinks first about the business and the customers, and then about what are all the awesome activities we need to do to drive, to have that kind of business impact. And um, I have to admit, like, I, I think when you have a number on your back and I tell, you know, people who want to go into marketing earlier in your career, if you have the opportunity to be in sales or in some kind of frontline customer facing role, do it because you will gain such an appreciation for what customers really need and what salespeople who in at least B2B, what salespeople really need. So um, I, I'd like to think I became a lot better about focus, what matters and um, you know, making sure that the even brand activities you know, pull through into demand programs and have impact on customers. Yeah, I think that's an ongoing conversation between CMOs and CROs because obviously the CRO has a number on their back every single day. And you see that their careers could sometimes be very, very short because it's so measurable. And I think they like to complain that maybe marketers don't really think of life in such a critical way. But I truly believe right now is a time where if you want to be at the CEO's table, if you want to be in the conversations with the boardroom, you need to think of what you're doing as being responsible for revenue. And it's not okay anymore to just think of yourself as a brand marketer when you're a CMO. Absolutely. hundred percent. And I think when you look at the marketers who are having impact, they're the ones with a seat at the table who look at the business, who think about how do I connect all of these incredible activities to business impact. And um, I think the other part about it too is like, I, I tell people this, like we can run a lot of activities. And, and even when I was interviewing at VMware, I said, look, if you're looking for somebody to run up and down the stairs faster, I am not your girl. If you are looking for someone to build high speed elevators to get to the hundredth floor consistently, repeatedly fast, that's what I do. And that's what I enjoy doing, which is building the team, the processes to get us to the hundredth floor in a high speed elevator. That's awesome. Um, that was going to be one of my questions is, I mean, you just said you've only been at um, VMware for three months. And so I'm so grateful that you're taking the time even to meet with us today and have this conversation. But i um, interested, I've talked to a lot of CMOs who do believe in this revenue focus and have been in their jobs for three, six, nine months. And I think it's a pretty common thing is that there's a CMO turnover when there is a change in the business. So can you talk to me about what attracted you to this role and really like what is, what is the directive that you kind of have now in this role? Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you for making the time to have me. I'm delighted to be here. I should have said that earlier. This is just such a nutty time. And I think the more we can help each other and share best practices, the, you know, the better. Um, so for me, it, there were a combination of things that attracted me to the role. So 
Um, number one, the people. I think, you know, after for a lot of us who have worked in the industry, you know, obviously working with great people makes a big difference in day to day satisfaction. Um, number two, the I, I believe I know. It's, it's been proven to me since I've been here, VMware is in a really unique strategic position in the industry. And I'll just double click really quickly. And this leads to my, my, my remit or my mission, if you will. The company has a long history. You know, it's a 20, 22 year old company that started with this incredible innovation called virtualization, which, you know, for, for which we have hundreds of thousands of customers like talk to any major enterprise and they they use vmware in some way shape or form so incredible foundation and over time the company has grown tremendously both organically and inorganically um and now we have five franchises there's you know multi-cloud we have an app modernization business we have that that's that speaks to developers and devops we have an end user computing business. We have a security business, which obviously affects everything and everyone all through the IT environment. Um, and we have a networking business that is kind of the underpinning for most enterprises. So we're able to have these conversations now at all these different levels. The company through its own innovations, as well as these acquisitions I mentioned, has transitioned dramatically from 100% licensed software to, in our recent public um, earnings announcement, we announced we're around 22% SaaS and subscription. So that's a real shift. And uh, you and I were talking about it earlier. It's not just a shift in business models and shift in how we go to market, how we treat our customers, how we market to them, how we nurture them, and how we recognize revenue and sales compensation. Like it's major change. And that is the business change that I stepped into and that frankly excites me, like, you know, coming in to be a peacetime CMO. Well, that would be no fun. Right? <laughs> so, we get the wartime, wartime CMO. I mean, we're living in this world where right now we have no sun. And then on top of it, <laughs> on top of it, you have a company that's going through major transformation. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, you know, my, my, you know, I did the usual, I came in first, first month, two months, I've been doing an extensive listening tour, talking to everybody at all different levels to understand like, what are we doing well? What are we not doing so well? Where are we trying to get to? Where do we need to be? And I tell people like, we are the largest non-cloud cloud provider. <laughs> and this, this is our SaaS and subscription businesses all around this, which is we have partnered with every single cloud provider out there from, you know, AWS was the first and, and still a preferred partner. Azure, Google Cloud, Alibaba, ten, I mean, just go down the list, IBM, et cetera. And the unique strategic position is the world is a multi-cloud world. You yeah, know, large enterprises, they have applications and workloads still on premise. They have them in clouds. They're choosing multiple clouds to you know, for different applications as well as to avoid lock-in and yeah. often, you know, yeah, for lots of reasons. So in this multi-cloud world, like where's the glue that holds it together? How are you going to, I call it all the illities, the manageability, the operability, the securability, the observability, like all the things that need to happen. And that frankly is the core of VMware, this, uh, this abstraction and ability through software to manage heterogeneous environments. That, that's what I think is pretty compelling. And um, I've spent a lot of time talking to CIOs. I've spent a lot of time talking to customers. And let me tell you, like, they struggle. They struggle with the move to the, like, they all want to move to the cloud. Many have, but then how do you manage across these heterogeneous environments? So that that's what I'm, I'm super excited about. That's awesome. You're so passionate about it. And I hope that in another nine months, you're just as passionate about it. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I mean, it's obviously a long journey. So it's not something where after three months or six months, you're going to come in and then it's just going to be this transition. And I do think in this world, it's challenging for people because they have to manage so many different things. Like the world has just changed so much in the past 10 years. And it's not 
letting up. I mean, it just continues to change. And so we all need to figure out like, what is this sort of overall overarching architecture that we're bringing together to kind of win in all the different parts of our business. One of the things that I think is interesting is that you have this dynamic, versatile background. Mm -hmm. And I would think that it helps you as you go to talk to these CIOs, all these different customers, you look at all the different technologies. What is it about your background that you think makes you uniquely positioned to kind of solve the challenges that VMware is going through with this big transformation? Yeah, you know, it's such a great question. I, I mean, I, I, I think that especially in technology marketing, you know, around these more complex systems, I think you have to have um, some affinity, some passion for the actual products and services. And, and, you know, when I was at Google Cloud, I, 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 I have been and I very hooked on what we're doing with machine learning, what we're doing with um, hybrid cloud. And I think you have to care and you have to have enough interest. And I think my advice to some marketers is it's, it's amazing to be an expert in demand gen, in content syndication, in social media, but what will really, you know, make you a superhero in these tech companies is if you can marry it with a, 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 a more deep, and I'm not a programmer, but a deeper understanding of what the products actually do and the value they bring. And so I, I think for me, part of that came from my first job out of B school was with Apple mm -hmm. and I was a product manager. And again, like I said, I was not technically trained at all. And um, they have an interesting model and they still have it today, which is the product manager or product marketing manager is both inbound and the outbound person. And it's based in a belief that if you don't understand how the products work, how could you actually communicate that and express that to customers well? And um, I just remember I spent my first few months like calling because, you know, we didn't have <laughs> weren't as ubiquitous as they are today, calling friends and saying, engineering friends and saying, I need you to explain to me what a motherboard actually does. I need you to explain to me ethernet and how this works. I need you. And like really going hard to understand because on the inbound side, like making decisions, like you probably don't remember, but like making decisions to drop the, the, the floppy drive was a big decision. Making the decision at Apple to go to ethernet was a big decision. Like, and if you don't understand it well enough, like who was I to make that decision? And then you know, the next hour you'd be in a meeting talking about the packaging and the pricing and what colors and what should the ads look like. And so it, it was forced training into like making sure you fully understand the why and the products and then also understanding the market. So I think that's, I'd love to see more marketers do that. And there are, there are some, uh, there are many actually, I shouldn't say, but I do think like for me, that is how I've tried to, um, you know, differentiate a little bit. And, and frankly, you know how it is with, with these companies, tech companies, where the DNA, like, you know, especially like Google and VMware, the DNA of the company is so steeped in engineering that, you know, there are only a few ways to gain credibility. You can have incredible market knowledge. You can have deep customer insight. And hopefully a little bit of product acumen. And if you can marry all of that, you can influence, make change happen. I think that's really important because what you're basically saying is that you have to understand the stakeholders and the DNA of the company that you're in because otherwise you get pigeonholed and or you have challenge to really influence and drive change or drive adoption and trust with um, the stakeholders in those other parts of the market. Yes, and um, I know you talked with a good friend of mine who I think is just amazing, Kate Bullis, at one point. And, you know, she and I have talked about this idea that, you know, I'm the CMO, I'm chief marketing officer. Well, why isn't chief market officer? And part of that is on us. And part of that is we need to educate the industry. We need to show up smart about the market. We need to show up smart about the customers and their customer journeys. We need to show up, you know, with a provocative and opi opinion. We need to show up with our opinions. 
Yeah, I think you and I come from sort of similar influences in the companies that we've been in, in this idea. And I love the idea you sort of portray of the product manager at Apple. And for the longest time, I have been a huge believer in product marketing because I think it's hard to hire product marketing because a lot of people were product managers doing what you're saying, both sides of the coin. And then they become product marketers, which is really a little bit more focused on the outbound. But I, I started my career doing that. And I feel like you get to touch all parts of the business, right? Because you have to understand the cogs on your product. You have to understand the market you're selling to. You have to understand all these things to come up with the right messaging, the positioning, the differentiation. And I think product marketing and CMO are two roles within marketing where you touch everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think, you know, when you look at what you're doing too, I think that ability to have that broader experience is so critical, so critical. And I'm sure that's why you're doing what you're doing too. Yeah. And I, I think it's also, it's painted this picture for me, which is why I have the podcast series and why um, I have my newsletter to really educate people that they should seek out this differentiated background because you want to be able to drive change. You want to be able to be strategic. And in my past three roles, I've been able to work with product to define the market. Like you said, the Kate Bullis, who are we going after? And then if you have that definition with marketing and product of what you're doing, it makes it so much easier to then go to make your number because you're telling a story and the products are actually built to align to that story and that audience, which then helps sales. And so it all kind of starts to come together when you really bring these teams together. And everything you just said becomes 10 times more important with SaaS, right? With products exactly. that, where the marketing is part of the product experience. Like it, it's so intertwined. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, when we spoke before, you also talked about how you had this very career with your CEO, your GM role, et cetera. Um, and it seems to me that you are willing to take a lot of risk. Like you weren't a CEO, but then you saw that opportunity and you said, okay, I'm gonna be a CMO, let's CEO, let's see what happens here. So how has that um, influenced you as a marketer or just in general as an executive in terms of this like risk tolerance? Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, like if you'd given me a piece of paper, I, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I certainly would never have expected I would have done these different things. It was more, it's a, I'm gonna just share this quick story and I, that I had been at Trend Micro like six and a half years and I was a general manager and um, which was the true GM role there. Like I had a PL, I had sales, I had engineering, I had marketing. And I had it in my head, Dodo Bird, and I, certainly mentor women to not do this. I had it in my head that I could not, and I was getting calls and pings for like president, COO, even CEO of small companies. But I had it in my head that because I had not been in a startup in 10 years, like that I had to go to a startup, do a functional role before I could be a CEO. Like, I, like, I wish somebody had said like, are you kidding? <laughs> Like, what are you thinking? So anyway, I, I took a, C, a CMO role at a startup that was the hottest startup, you know, hot, 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 you know, lots of VCs, brand names, Greylock, blah, blah, blah. And um, it was, I was there for two years. It was a very, very rocky experience at the end because the head of sales and myself, we went to the board and said, our CEO is great, super nice, um, but probably is not the person to scale the company. At which point the board brought in a COO who then became CEO. Anyway, the COO came in and he brought in his own folks. So, you know, I think we've all- for the company and not and the end being a good thing for you. <laughs> right. So, you know, it, we've all seen this movie, but I remember I said this, what started it is I said to a friend, I said, you know what? I said like, I feel like I know more than the CEO. <laughs> and, and, and she said, she said, well, I don't understand like why you, you're not a CEO. Like everybody has to have a first, of course, you know? And, um, and I said, yeah, I said, well, maybe instead of working for Dodo birds, I should go be the Dodo bird. And then 
literally she, 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 which is, you know, a good friend. She said, why don't you do this? Cause you're not in a rush. You, you, you're thankfully you don't have like a financial, you know, end of the road coming. Why don't you just give yourself, call it six months, a year, whatever you're comfortable with and say, every phone call I get for a CMO role, I am going to say, no, no, no. I'm actually looking for CEO roles. And she said, see what happens. And I got to tell you, Trish, it was like the strangest thing. It works. Like if you just, like I thought Put it out there. Say, oh no, no, you can't be a CEO. Like, what are you talking about? But literally I'd say this to every recruiter who called me like, you know, actually I'm really interested in CEO roles. Here are the type of companies. And they were all like, oh yeah, okay. Well, I have these other things I'm working. Like, it, it's amazing, you know, you just have to put it out there. And anyway, make a long story short, I did end up taking the CEO of, of Elastic Box, which then I subsequently sold um, um, 18 months later. And that's another really incredible learning experience. And um, I did it because I thought there was a, I thought I could be a better CEO. And, you know, I thought I had enough experience. Of course, I learned a tremendous amount in the role. And, um, it, it, you know, it's hard. It's hard. And the hardest part for me was not the work or the product market fit or the hiring and firing. The hardest part for me was the emotional responsibility, which I think all CEOs must, I know they feel. Yeah, and, like for the employees, for the future of the company, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, like, you know, we're at the holiday party and instead of relaxing and celebrating with the team, you know, my husband's like, what's wrong with you? And I said, I, I mean, I'm looking around at these, <laughs> you know, kids and families and feeling this incredible weight, like, oh, you know, if we don't, you know, get to escape velocity, this is on me. So yeah. that's the yeah, emotion. I think that's hard. Yeah. I was, know, um, I know George Hugh, you know, I worked with him at Salesforce and, um, when I was deciding to be a C CMO and when I was leaving Salesforce to go interview for different positions, of course, I had a long history in product marketing, had a long history in demand gen. And, um, I was talking to him and I said, Hey, you know, you left Salesforce and you created your own company. You were growing the company. It was doing really well. You ended up selling it, but then your next role you took as the COO of Twilio. And he said, you know what? I just decided that not every company I could be the number two and really enjoy and be passionate about what I was doing. But that weight of being the CEO wasn't my favorite thing. He said, you should decide, do you want to be the number one and carry the weight of your department, of the team, et cetera, or do you want to be the number two? And you know, look at the things that you'll be able to achieve at a company and, and make that as a conscious decision. Yeah. And I, I, I right on a hundred percent. And then the other piece of it too, is I think for type A folks, like there's this, oh, I want that CEO title, but then you realize like, it's not really about the title. It's about the team. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, trend micro where I was a general manager was such a great experience. I learned so much, you know, I ran this business that we grew from 150 million to almost 600 million. And I made this transition, I call it the me to we transition where, you know, it's not just about me, it's really, you know, the success is based upon the team, not me. And when you're a CEO, you realize that even more and so much so that um, the title doesn't matter as much. Do, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. if somebody came along with an amazing CEO opportunity, of course I'd consider it, you know, potentially, but like, I don't have that ambition to like, I have to have a title. For yeah. me, it's like, can I have the impact? So a lot of what you were just sharing that George said. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, but I also think, and um, if you're willing to share, I'd love to hear your perspective, not just about sort of title versus team, but the loneliness at the top. Like I look at the CEO as such a tough role because at least in the C-suite, you have your C-suite peers. When I left Salesforce to go to be a CMO, I left a a team of people where I had all of these amazing VP, SVP peers that I could go to and we could brainstorm. And if you think you're at the top, I mean, you're at the top. So what is it like to, is it lonely? And also like, how do you kind of supplement that? Because obviously CEOs aren't up there because they just want to be by themselves. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, um, I put together what I call Carol's kitchen cabinet. 
<laughs> yeah, because it kind of like, you know, I took that job at Apple and I didn't know very much about motherboards and chips and how computers actually work. I did the same thing. I, I called up four friends and I said, okay, you were a first time CEO at one point. You're now, and, and it has to be, it cannot be your board. It cannot be your execs. It has to be, you know, they have to be people who will give you hard truths and are not associated with your business at all. Right. And so that was my kitchen cabinet. And I went to them all a lot. Like, this is what I'm seeing. Did you ever see this? What did you think? What did you do? Um, there are a lot of more structured forms for CEOs, but I just found for myself, I was much more comfortable with four people who had known me with whom I'd worked, who had gone through a first time CEO experience. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I mean, I even think like being a CMO in some cases, you know, it depends on how big your company is, but it can be a little bit lonely because I mean, the eye is on you to make all these decisions about the marketing. And like, I have the idea of having what I call the personal board, which is kind of like your, you know, your Carol's kitchen cabinet of just people that are outside your company that you can ping. And like two weeks ago, I had somebody ping me and they said, oh, like we're going through such like unprecedented times and nobody thought the revenue would grow this way or that way back in May or June, but now it's August and everything seemed like it was going great. And all of a sudden our conversion from, you know, um, leads and meetings to pipeline has just like fallen through the floor. Are you seeing the same thing? And, and I said, yeah, it's really weird. In the last two weeks, we've seen this major slowdown in, you know, this transition from holding the meeting to opening the opportunity and progressing. And we talked to multiple people, the little personal board. And it was like, yep, we're seeing the same thing. It must be because people are freaking out going back to school end of summer. It's a really you know busy time for distraction. And so we should just see what happens, like get into September. And now, you know, it's all back on the up and the up, but it was really valuable to have that group of people to just like ping that idea out and see what was happening. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. I mean, we have VMworld coming in two weeks and for sure, like, you know, virtual events at scale, whew, this is all new territory for so many of us. And I've been pinging a lot of industry friends to say, okay, what are you seeing? And did you see, you know, that last minute registration and what level of engagement and what tips and tricks do you have? So for sure.